keep those questions coming. Let us know when you do pass. Congratulations to everyone who recently has. Work hard. Study hard. Let's get to our questions. Question one. Grace always feels uneasy about going into her client's home. She sometimes feels like it is not a safe environment but has no proof. One day, Grace is contacted by the local law enforcement agency. They ask Grace to provide some details about the client for an investigation they are conducting. What should Grace do? This is an ethics question, and it's ripped straight from the ethical code. What you'll find is most ethical questions are ripped straight from the code. The challenge becomes knowing the code, right? Because it's a little more dry, it's long, it's a little boring to learn, okay? But if you dedicate a few good study days to that code, you're going to come out better for it. For instance, this one, what are we asking about? We're asking about Grace, who was contacted by a local law enforcement agency for information about a client. What do we typically know about sharing information about clients? We need informed consent. We need permission, all of that. However, when it's a law enforcement agency, that might change. So let's, let's look at A. A, refuse to give out details without the consent of the stakeholders. Typically, this might be the case. But when law enforcement agencies are involved, the code says we can provide details to the law enforcement agency only. So that would be B. Now, if somebody else comes along, the school or a teacher, we need to make sure they have consent. Law enforcement agencies, as part of an investigation, are allowed to gain this knowledge from us without typical procedures. C, report herself to the BACB for not disclosing her thoughts earlier. Nothing indicates Grace did anything wrong here. And then D, refuse to give out details without the consent of the client. Again, it's the law enforcement agency only. As long as we're only giving the information to law, enfor the law enforcement agencies, Grace has done nothing wrong. Two, of the following, which one would be the worst to target using a changing criterion design? Whenever we get a question and it has a specific term in it, before we go to our answer choices, let's think about the term, okay? This is going to force us to actually consider the question and critically think about the question. Too many people want to read the question, jump immediately to the answer choices, try to see if an answer choice jumps out, out, out at them. If it doesn't, they go back to the question and they repeat that cycle. You use up a lot of time, you use up a lot of energy, and it's just not efficient. Instead, spend all your time up front on the question. So what is a changing criteria on design? Well, a changing criteria on design, we're trying to increase or decrease a behavior that's already in somebody's repertoire systematically by going either up or down. It's essentially what a cri changing criteria on design is, right? So if we're looking for the worst behavior to target, we would want ideally something that isn't in their repertoire, right? Or something that can't be reversed, okay? So A, reducing the number of cigarettes that are smoked. This is a perfect changing criteria on design behavior, okay? We can systematically manipulate it. It's already in the client's repertoire. A is perfect. B, increasing the number of miles you can run. Again, absolutely a way to target it, right? Number of miles you can run can be reversed. If you stop running, right, you tend to lose your endurance and how many miles you can run. On the other hand, we can systematically increase how many miles you can run. And assuming you have running in your repertoire, which most people who can walk can run, right, B is not bad either. C, teaching a child how to read new words. What's the key here? The key is this word new. Remember, changing criteria on design is not used to teach new behaviors. That behavior already needs to be in the client's repertoire. All right. So even if you were considering A or B, as soon as you see the word new, okay, you immediately should think answer has to be C because we're thinking about a changing criteria on design. And then D, increasing the number of dumplings you can make. Absolutely, if it's already in your repertoire because we are increasing it, you can systematically increase the number of dumplings you make through a changing criteria and design. The best answer for the worst behavior to target is going to be C, teaching a child how to read new words. Also, don't skip over this word, right? Worst. Adding or removing a word like worst, a word like not, changes the whole question entirely. 
go slow. Okay, make sure we understand what the question is asking. Three, which of the following basic reinforcement schedules features a post reinforcement pause with a high steady rate of responding? Basic reinforcement schedules, fixed ratios, fixed intervals, variable ratios, variable intervals, okay, includes things like scallop effects, right? Um, consistent steady responding. This question wants to know about a reinforcement schedule with a high steady rate of responding and a post reinforcement pause. So think about a fixed ratio. What does a fixed ratio say? A fixed ratio says after a certain number of response, responses, you're going to get reinforcement. That's consistent. It's never going to change, right? Because it's fixed. So if I'm on an FR5 and I know I'm on an FR5, what am I going to do? Well, I might engage in five responses very quickly, get my reinforcement, and then what? Well, I might pause for a second, right? Take a break, play with the reinforcement, you know, relax. And then what? And then I'm going to go back to a high steady state of responding, get reinforcement, the cycle continues. So what we're looking for here is fixed ratio, okay? These, you just kind of need to know. You need to know the scallop effect, right? We need to know the consistent rate of responding, and we need to know high steady rates with the post reinforcement pause. The high steady rates with the post reinforcement pause is going to be A, fixed ratio. Strawberries act as a powerful reinforcer for Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit's mom is worried that Peter Rabbit does not respond to praise appropriately. If you were to work with Peter Rabbit, what procedure might you implement? Okay, slow down. Let's look at the question. If we're working with Peter Rabbit, what procedure might you implement? Well, what do we know? On the exam, we don't assume anything and we trust the information they're giving us. We only use the information they're giving us because it's enough to answer the question. All we know is strawberries act as a powerful reinforcer. Peter Rabbit's mom is worried that Peter Rabbit does not respond to praise. So being a future BCBA, if you know strawberries are a powerful reinforcer and you want praise okay, to become a reinforcer, and if someone doesn't respond to praise appropriately already, what are you going to do? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Pairing, right? We're going to try to pair these strawberries, which already have reinforcing properties, to praise to try to create praise as a reinforcer. So let's look at A. Give Peter a strawberry after he engages in the desired response and avoid praise. Is this going to help out with the problem of not responding to praise? No, right? Because we already know strawberries are a powerful reinforcer. If we avoid praise, we have no chance of pairing the two together, right? So A is out. B, provide praise for engaging in the desired response until it starts to function as a reinforcer. Can we just brute force something to make it a reinforcer? No. You can try and you might succeed occasionally, right? But if Peter Rabbit has no interest in praise, providing him praise over and over again isn't really going to do anything. How do we take a neutral stimulus and make it reinforcing? We pair it with a already reinforcing stimulus, in this case, strawberries. C, before Peter is able to engage in the correct response, give him a strawberry and then praise. Well, what are we reinforcing in this scenario? Not the correct response, right? We're just giving him a strawberry for no reason. Now, could we pair strawberries and praise this way? Potentially, yes. So C might not be the worst answer, but is there a better way to do this that's going to be more effective as a whole? Well, if you look at D, once Peter engages in the correct response, give him both praise and a strawberry. There we go. We've got the correct response. We're offering praise and a strawberry at the same time. And C, we're giving the strawberry and then praise, right? D is just a better, more complete answer than C. Remember, we want the best answer, okay? Common problem with people who are multiple test takers, they struggle identifying between two answers, right? We're looking for the best answer. We're looking for the most complete answer. And to do that, we really have to understand what the question is asking and answer the question fully. Okay. So our answer is D. Once Peter engages in the correct response, give him both praise and a strawberry. If you were describing to me the deceleration of a line graph, you would be describing what? Pretty easy question, in all honesty. There's 185 questions on the exam, right? It's a lot of questions, but not all of them are going to be the most difficult, most hard question you've ever seen in your life, right? So when you get a question like this, which is 
in all intents and purposes, pretty easy. Just trust yourself, pick the best answer, and move on. Okay, we're not here to overthink these things, right? If you've prepared how you should and you're fluent, don't overthink it. You need to trust yourself, okay? Have confidence. So when this says, if you're describing to me the deceleration of a line graph, what are you describing? When we think of deceleration, we think of what? We think of reduction, right? Slowing down. And if the behavior is slowing down on a line graph, what's it doing? Well, it's probably decreasing, right? And if the line is decelerating, it's going down, 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 okay? So we're describing level trend of variability. Well, of course, we're going to describe trend, right? Deceleration has to do with trend. If we talk about an accelerating line, it's also trend. So if you're describing to me the deceleration of a line graph, you are describing trend. James want to in, wants to increase a student's on-task behavior, but has other students to worry about. He can take data on the student's behavior for about 15 minutes each class. What type of measurement should James use? All right, a couple things going on here, right? It's a measurement question, so we want to identify what type of measurement he should use. What's important in this question, okay? One, James has other students to worry about, okay? Two, he can take data on the student's behavior for about 15 minutes. So immediately, immediately, right, what do we eliminate? Continuous measurement. If he's got other students and he can only take it for about 15 minutes, continuous measurement just doesn't seem like the best option, right? Continuous measurement says we need to record every instance of behavior when it's occurring, right? In this case, we can't do that. So now we have discontinuous measurement. So we have whole interval versus momentary time sampling. So what's the other important part of this? The has other students to worry about. So whole interval, we need to be sure what? We need to be sure we're watching the behavior the entire time. Because the idea behind whole interval recording is if the behavior occurs the whole time, it counts as a response. In this case, if he has other students, he might be pulled away for a second. So how can we, how can we um, work around that? Well, we can do momentary time sampling, right? James can set a timer right? For one minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever it might be. Whenever that timer goes off, he checks on the student's behavior, marks a response, or doesn't. That indicates a momentary time sampling. So we're not using continuous measurement. We're using discontinuous measurement. We're using the better form of discontinuous measurement given James's situation, right? And that's what we're really worried about. Given James's time, resources, and situation, what's going to be the most effective way to measure the client's behavior? C, momentary time sampling. Terry's daughter is almost old enough to stay at home by herself. Terry wants to make sure that his daughter can prepare basic meals, so he develops a task chain for making meals. The only problem is the daughter will often quit in the middle of something if it becomes too difficult. What type of chaining should Terry use? Think about the types of chaining we have, right? Forward chain, backward chain, total task chain, okay? And the behavior chain interrupts the strategy. Well, we're teaching her already. Okay, we're teaching her this skill. So we're not going to use behavior chain interruption strategy yet. Additionally, we know the daughter escapes. So interrupting the behavior chain might not be the best idea if she already engages in escape behavior, right? What about total task chain? Well, if total task chain, we're, we're teaching the behavior, okay, we're assuming that she needs to learn most of the steps, right? He's already he's just developing this task chain now to teach the meals, okay? So we're going to go a forward or backward chaining. The last thing we know, again, is the daughter tries to escape. So using forward chaining required, requires what? It requires the daughter to complete the first step of the chain independently. Once she does that successfully, we prompt, right? And then the first and second. So it's a very slow burn, okay, to that reinforcement. Backward chaining, we're going to walk her through the whole task. Escape is going to be the reinforcement in a way, right? Because she just needs to do the last step and then she's done. So why don't we take advantage of the daughter wanting to quit in the middle of something by using escape to our advantage, right? So if escape is the issue, backward chaining is going to be a great type of chaining to use. We're using that to our advantage. Do the last step and you're done. We're going to help you through the entire thing. We're going to get you through the middle, the hard part. All you need to do is the last step. You're done. Backward chaining your staff on a new procedure that you learned after completing a continuing education module.
You describe the skill and then model the skill for the RBTs. What should you do next? Yeah, this falls under personnel management, training, and supervision. It's a very difficult section for most people, but we need to think about it as we are working with a client, right? And when you're working with a client, what are we doing? Well, we're picking skills, we're setting goals, we're modeling, we're training, and then we're watching them do it, right? It's the same idea here, okay? Train, monitor, reinforce, implement over and over and over again, right? Training is just like training clients, okay? In this case, what have we done? We've picked a skill, we've described the skill, and we've modeled the skill. What's next? Well, if we're looking on our checklist, okay, after we model, typically we're going to role play. Once we role play, then we can let the RBTs go loose by themselves. So what we're looking for is role play. After you describe it and then you model it, now we want to role play to be sure that we have it correct before we let the RBTs do it themselves. So A, observe the RBTs with clients implementing the skill. All right. Not quite there yet. Okay. First, we need to be able to know the RBTs can do it. Right. All we've done so far is we've told them about the skill and we've modeled the skill for them. But before we let them go and do it themselves, okay, we want to see that they can do it, right? And we're going to do that with role play. So we all get together. We all start role playing with the clients how the skill is supposed to look. Once we've role played and we can trust them, then the RBTs can go in and we can conduct supervision, basic supervision, and observe the RBTs on their own, okay? But first, we need to see they can do it because if we role play, and we figure out maybe our training wasn't sufficient. Maybe they're missing a key piece. Well, we can go back and retrain it, right? We can go back and remodel it before letting them loose on clients themselves, okay? So we have to do it systematically. Remember, personnel management, training, and supervision, it's systematic, just like when we are dealing with clients, okay? So B looks like our best answer. C, provide feedback to the clients. Well, we're not really there yet. And then D, take data on the RBTs with the clients. Again, we're not getting ahead of ourselves here, right? Training needs to be systematic. We don't just model the skill and then say, okay, go out in the real world and do it, okay? We want to be sure our training was effective. Ethically, we have our responsibility to the clients to be sure our training is adequate. Remember, you're responsible for your RBTs, for your supervisees. So if you're training on something, make sure it's right and known before you allow them to do it. So B is going to be our answer. Remember, describe the skill, model the skill, role play the skill, observe. If you wanted your client to touch the letter A, which of the following would be an example of a within stimulus prompt? So within stimulus prompt, that is our key here. That is what we're talking about. This is what we're thinking about. So first thing, what is a stimulus prompt? Well, it's a prompt that's going to act on the stimulus, right? Remember, we have response prompts and stimulus prompts. A response prompt would be like a physical prompt. We are guiding, physically prompting the response out. A stimulus prompt is going to be something like a positional prompt, a sizing prompt, okay? We're acting on the stimulus itself. If we're looking at a within stimulus prompt, we're looking at something that directly changes how that stimulus looks. Okay, and be careful with that idea, right? So we're going to make, if we're doing a within stimulus prompt, we might make that letter bigger. We might make that letter smaller. We might change the font, change the color, okay? It needs to act directly on the stimulus's physical characteristics. So A, circle the letter A. Have we changed the characteristics of the letter A? Well, no, all we've done is circle it, right? We've actually add an additional prompt, okay? So it's not within stimulus. What about highlight the letter A? Be careful here, right? We've added a prompt, which is the highlight, but the letter A hasn't changed in size, hasn't changed font, hasn't changed color, hasn't changed uppercase, lowercase. We haven't acted on the stimulus itself. We've just added the highlight. If you look at C, you make the letter A or larger. Well, now we've changed the physical characteristics of that letter A. Okay, C looks like our answer. D, you physically guide the client's hands to letter A. That's going to be a response prompt acting on the response itself. Our answer here is going to be 
see. Finally, my colleagues and I are researching the effects of deprivation on cats. We are feeding cats catnip and then depriving them of the catnip over several days. What concentration are our cat actions categorized under? The different types of behaviorism, right? The different types of behaviorism listed on the task list are pretty straightforward, but they give people issues because when we think about behaviorism, we, we typically think about ABA because that's what we do, right? So we never really think about practice guided by behavior analysis or experimental analysis of behavior. So let's think about it this way, okay? Skinner did what? Well, Skinner found radical behaviorism, okay? Once he had radical behaviorism, he said, well, I want to start learning more about it. So he went into his lab and he started working with his rats, okay? Hitting switches, doing operant experiments. He was doing experimental analysis of behavior within a lab with animals. That's going to be experimental analysis. Then he said, I want to take what I know now, okay, and, and I want to research it in the real world with people. So he took it out to the real world with people, and he started researching and observing and taking data, doing applied behavior analysis. And that's what ABA is, right? That's what we do as BCBAs. We design interventions, and we record data, and we research how they affect behavior. Okay, we're in the natural environment with humans. Practice guided by behavior analysis is now taking what we've learned and implementing it for behavior change procedures for socially valid means. Typically, your RBTs are doing practice guided by behavior analysis, right? Actually implementing and working with clients using what we know. So again, experimental analysis, think of a lab with rats and animals. Applied behavior analysis, think of the real world with humans. Practice guided by behavior analysis, think of taking what we've learned from the lab and from ABA and implementing it to actually change behavior. In this case, we are feeding cats catnip and then depriving them of catnip over several days. Okay, Is that experimental, applied, practice guided, or outside the realm? Well, since we're systematically manipulating things, okay, feeding cats and depriving them, we're trying to figure out the effects. It's not going to be practice guided. It's not applied behavior analysis because this is in a controlled setting with animals. So we are looking at experimental analysis of behavior A. Okay, we'll be back next week with the continuation of our questions. As always, check out bcbastudy.com.